Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service today at St. Luke's in Pickwick. We're always glad to have you here with us, and if we have any guests and visitors, and I know that we do, please don't forget to sign our guest register before you leave, and you're always welcome to come back to worship with us again. For our worshipers who are at home watching us on uh, our website and on YouTube, uh, worship services here live, 9 o'clock Sunday morning, 6.30 Thursday evenings. You're always welcome to attend. Our opening hymn today, hymn number 221, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. on page 15, Common Service, and here at church up on the front wall. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy, Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. sins. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for the third Sunday of the season of Lent is recorded in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 14 through 21. Here's what the prophet writes. I have been silent for a long time. I have kept still. I have restrained myself. But now, like a woman giving birth, I will scream, I will gasp and pant. I will dry up mountains and hills. I will make all their grass wither. I will turn rivers into islands. I will dry up pools. I will lead the blind on the way they do not know. Along paths they do not know, I will direct them. Ahead of them, I will turn darkness into light and rough places into level ground. These are the things I will accomplish for them. I will not abandon them. They will be turned back and completely disgraced, those who trust in an idol, and completely disgraced they, when they trust those idols and those molten images. They say, you are our gods. You deaf ones, listen. You blind ones, watch carefully so that you can see. Who is, as, who is as blind as my servant? Who is as deaf as my messenger whom I sent? Who is as blind as my associate, as blind as the servant of the Lord? You, Israel, see many things, but you do not observe. Israel opens his ears, but he does not hear. Because of his own righteousness, the Lord was pleased to make his law great and glorious. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. The epistle lesson for today is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14, uh, the words of St. Paul. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of the for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, and do not participate in fruitless deeds of darkness. Instead, expose them. 
for it is shameful even to mention the things that are done by people in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes things visible. Therefore it is said, Awake, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Here ends our epistle lesson. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Please stand for our gospel lesson. <coughs> the Holy Gospel this morning is recorded in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, 13 through 17, and then 34 to 39. As Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that God's works might be revealed in connection with him. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day, Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Later on in the chapter, they brought this man who had been blind to the Pharisees. Now it was Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man told them. I washed and now I see. Then some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others were saying, how can a sinful man work such miraculous signs? There was a division among them, so they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. The man replied, He is a prophet. They answered him, You are entirely born in sinfulness, yet you presume to teach us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, sir? The man replied, That I may believe in him. Jesus answered, You have seen him, and he is the very one who is speaking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he knelt down and worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. Here ends our gospel lesson. We'll continue with the confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed in the hymn that starts on page 18. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again 
is he with the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, 338. I heard the voice of Jesus say. this morning is recorded in our gospel lesson, uh, selected verses throughout the book of John. I'm just going to read one or two at this time, and the others will come out during the message for today. Jesus saw a man born blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents but that God's works might be revealed in connection with him. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Please be seated for our message today. We're going to be looking at different points of view, and I brought a poster from my office, and I'm going to get just a little closer, because... I'm going to show it to you, and you really won't be able to see it. <laughs> and I, I don't even think the camera could possibly pick it up either. <laughs> this is one of the Magic Eye posters. Uh, I got it in Nebraska when that was kind of a, a craze and thing that was going on. And <clears throat> my kids got some uh, books from school that had some of these different pictures that were in them that... You could take a look at them, but you have no idea what you were looking at unless somehow you figured it out. They did. I didn't. <laughs> Dad, can't you see it? No. <laughs> How do you do it? Well, we really can't explain it to you. <laughs> You'll just have to figure it out. And it did not, was not something that came quickly or easily. It probably took over a week. And I tried not to try very often 
but I kept going back to their pictures and finally, finally I was able to do that. And then we saw this uh, for sale at one of the shops in downtown uh, Norfolk, Nebraska. And I knew I had to have it because it is a religious picture. I'm not going to tell you at this time, uh, remind me on Easter Sunday, but I'm gonna have it in the back of the church if you'd like to check it out for yourselves and see if you can find what's the message. This morning, I realized, okay, if I'm going to talk about this, I better make sure I can still do it. <laughs> and so I, I went over to where it was hanging, and I thought, okay, now, am I, should I get close? Do I get far away? I can't really remember. And it took about 15 seconds, and then it just popped out. Oh, yeah, this works. So I'm going to put this off to the side so that we're not going to be distracted by it anymore. <laughs> so I use the picture to try to illustrate point of view. I know what the picture is because I've worked at it to be able to, to see it. And Jesus reminds us in our story, our lesson for today, that point of view is very important. And we're going to look at a variety of different points of view. And as we go through those different points, we'll see that people see different things. And God sees everything. Our points of view are, are kind of limited. We see sometimes what we want to see instead of what we should see. And sometimes it just takes some opening of your mind, some conversation with others to be able to see, here's a bigger picture when we put together some different points of view. Our lesson starts out very simply. Jesus was passing by. He saw a man blind from birth. And as he sees this man blind from birth, <clears throat> He's already known. The disciples are going to ask some questions about this. And I want them to. So he's prepared to talk about a man who was born blind from birth. And take a look at it through their perspective. Through his perspective. Through God's perspective. And finally, also through the enemies of Jesus. From their perspective. Jesus already knows how the uh, lesson is going to end. So this little object lesson that he found, and he was able to walk by, and his disciples would immediately notice. <clears throat> Did they know the man? I'm not exactly sure. Did he have a little sign that said, man born blind, to try to get more pity from the followers? Can't answer that either, but the entire group knew this man has been blind from birth. And the disciples asked, here's a good question for you, Jesus. <laughs> blind from birth. Was it his fault? Was it his parents' fault? How do you explain this? Because we don't get it. We aren't coming from the right point of view. Our perspective is limited to our understanding of kind of how things work. And usually, we're used to having things, a cause and an effect. It's not the effect and then the cause, but it's you know, a, a natural, re normal relationship of cause and effect. He's blind. There's got to be a reason. And it's either him or his parents. And Jesus very quickly let them know that it's not that this man sinned or his parents, but it's for here and now that God's works might be revealed in connection with him. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. I am the light of the world. So Jesus is getting their eyes open to a brand new perspective. 
they have seen him do miracles. Miracles that they could not possibly understand. Miracles that they knew could only have been done by God. And for the thoughts of all of the people of that time and centuries afterwards, someone born blind, this is irreversible. There wasn't a specific cause that we know and understand, but Jesus saw everything about it, and this poor man had to wait until Jesus walked by. That, you know, brings up all kinds of other questions from our perspective. Why? Why this time? Why this man? Why didn't he do it sooner? Why did he let him be born blind? I mean, we have just so many questions that Jesus just goes right on past and says, I'm the reason. Trust and believe me. And you'll be able to see what's going to happen, what's going to take place. This man is born blind. And Jesus stops where he is at. Jesus has also healed another blind man in the gospel, I believe it's Matthew, blind Bartimaeus. And when Bartimaeus was led to Jesus, his first words were, Lord, I want to see. And here we have a blind beggar who does not understand what's going on, who is there with him, and how this is all, what's going to happen. Am I going to get an offering? Am I going to get a, dip, a gift, a donation? Are they going to hurt me? Are they going to do something? And Jesus is just talking about, you know, me, a blind man. And then Jesus does a miracle, an extraordinary miracle. A miracle that is so simple in how it's performed and yet so profound that it worked. Spit in his hands took some dirt, rolled it around and made a little bit of mud, and then went over to this poor blind man and put that mud on his eyes. And then very simply told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I'm, I'm expecting that his friends who were there with him knew who Jesus was. And when he did this to the blind man and told him to go to the pool, there were a group that were probably just right there ready and willing to help him so that he didn't get lost, so he didn't get hurt, so he could find the pool and make his way back. And they wanted to get him there quickly. And everybody wanted to see what's going to happen. And very simply, he went, he washed, and he came back seeing. Wow, that was fantastic. Could we possibly pick a miracle that Jesus did that we would say that that was his signature miracle? And, of course, the answer is, whatever one you like is always going to be one that's really important to you in your eyes from your point of view. All the miracles that Jesus did. It's hard to pick out a favorite. Uh, just this weekend, I'm a, a big NBA fan, and all of the news about the NBA was LeBron made 40,000 points. And then there's videos of which, which one of his points, 40,000 points, do you think was the most important? No, no. Too many to even begin to pick. And with Jesus, it's even more miraculous everything that he did because he did that for a purpose and for a reason so this man could see, so his disciples could see what they hadn't noticed before they knew who Jesus was, they knew what he could do, but now they're seeing something that was really profound. Their eyes were opened, and they were continuing to grow in their faith. And others who saw this 
also had an opportunity to come to know Jesus, the light of the world, showing miracles of mercy to those who would have no help without his help. And throughout the New Testament scriptures, Jesus refers to himself many times as I am the light of the world. The I am statement at the beginning lets us know that this is a connection with the Old Testament phrase, I am who I am. And Jesus is saying that it says, I am that God of the Old Testament, <clears throat> Old Testament, New Testament, continued time, forever. I am that God, and I'm here for the world. And that's why he came into this world, to be here in this world. <clears throat> As this event goes on, Jesus, from the break in the chapter right here, it does not seem that Jesus had a conversation with this man when he came back. But he came back, and there was quite a big stir, and because of that, they brought the poor, formerly blind man to the Pharisees. They'd like a religious expert's opinion on what had just happened because they didn't understand it. And the Pharisees immediately had an answer from their point of view. It's the Sabbath day. Someone did something, and that's illegal. Whoever this person was, he worked on the Sabbath day. One of my notes in one of my comprehensive Bibles talked about Kneading bread, not N-E-E-D, but K-N-E-A-D, getting bread ready from scratch and making it, you couldn't even do that with your hands on the Sabbath day because that was considered work. And Jesus, he was spit and dirt, put it together. He obviously worked. And so their point of view is going to be blindness, it's just their point of view. You're telling me that you are, we're born blind, that this man, not identified by Jesus, told you to, or put some mud on your eyes and told you to go to the pool and wash? And you expect us to believe this? Some of the other verses will go on to remind us that, are, is everyone here sure that this is the man who was born blind? And everyone is, yep, he's the one. We've seen him here for years, and this isn't the kind of thing that you fake for your entire life. Being blind, being a beggar, being dependent on others, it's real. And the Pharisees didn't want to believe that either, because that's a different point of view not in agreement with what they were looking for. They went and sent messengers to ask his parents, is this your son? Yes, that is our son. Was he born blind? Absolutely. Explain how come he can see now. We can't. Because you can't explain a miracle. And for them, it was just hearing about it now. Ask him. He's of legal age. Let's hear what his point of view is of what took place and what happened. They asked the man because they were getting kind of frustrated in their words of accusation, trying to figure out what took place. What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He didn't see it happen. He only saw it after it happened. But he's still a smart man. He is a prophet. He is a prophet. That is not the answer that the Pharisees and the other teachers wanted to hear at all, that there was a prophet among them, and they hadn't really known about it, that they did not agree with this prophet, and that they were going to be looking for ways to get rid of this prophet. So they immediately put him in his place. You can't teach us. 
you're wrong, and kicked him out. That point of view was blind. The blind leading the blind. The man with new sight needing though, leading those who thought they had sight but were in reality blind. And their blindness simply was unbelief. They did not trust in the Messiah that was there with them. They did not see that Jesus was that Messiah. They were just blind to these things, even though they had been hearing, as all Israel had been hearing, all the miracles that Jesus was accomplishing. Miracles that no one could explain. Miracles that no one else could do. And he was doing them. That point of view had an opportunity to have their eyes opened but didn't want to. They wanted to keep their eyes shut as tight as possible, their ears shut as tight. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want anything to do with it. You get out of here. Well, Jesus heard about this. And he found that man. And because the man had not seen him before, he starts to talk to him. Do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, sir, the man replied, that I may believe in him. So he's, he's open to believing in the Son of God. That's a good thing. You've seen him. And he's the very one who's speaking to you now. You? Yep. Me. I'm the one. I'm the Son of God. And his answer, Lord, I believe. And his response, physical response, knelt down and worshipped him. Now he realized why his eyes were opened. Not just as a witness for many other people who see and hear about it, but that it was for him that he could see Jesus, he could acknowledge that he was his Savior, and that he would come to believe in him and know that he was there for him. And he would know that everything that God has done has been done for his benefit, as everything that Jesus does is for the benefit of individuals, of the entire world, <coughs> of everything here in, this, in what's going on around us. It has a purpose and a reason. And then we probably immediately think of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And in all things, God works for the good of those who believe him, trust in him. According to, and he works it out according to his promise. Jesus works things out. We don't, we don't get to see the immediate point of when it's going to happen. We just kind of have to go through this world and believe whatever it is that we're dealing with, Jesus has a point of view that sees every part of it, and he sees the solution that will be a part of it. And so he reminds us to constantly look to the empty cross, look to our Savior, offer our prayers to him, and believe that this is the Savior of the world and that the purpose that he especially has for us, watching over us here in this world, but making sure that we can be able to get to heaven. Sometimes that kind of seems like a, a long end purpose because we're here for years. And sometimes it's hard to wait for the big fulfillment of everything working out for good for us. And yet Jesus constantly is there for us to help us through all the little things along the way. To keep on encouraging us to remind us that I helped you through this. I helped you through this. You saw me working with others in their lives as they came to you in prayer as our congregation came together in prayer for others in their time of need, whatever need that that is. God works them out for here and now. Job had a tough time. Talked about that on one the Ash Wednesday, Ash Thursday for us, but we talked about that, that all the troubles that he went through, he had no clue why he was getting picked on. And yet God knew the entire time and allowed it to happen 
and worked everything out for his good. We want to look at things through the point of view of how God tells us in the scriptures, here's how we see and understand the events that are going on around us, within us, and with our loved ones. We go back to the scriptures to be encouraged and reminded time and time again that God sees. And he sees it from every point of view, but he especially sees it through the point of view of total love, total commitment to us, and a total sacrifice that Jesus will make for us so that we can be encouraged to put our hope and trust in him and have our eyes open more and more as we hear, read, and learn about the scriptures because there's so much more information in there that we can cover in one Sundays or a year of Sundays that God wants us to know for our benefit. And so we ask God to continue to strengthen us, strengthen us through studying the scriptures, and then we get to see Jesus. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs> stand for prayer. <clears throat> In connection with our Lenten prayer for today, we have a prayer um, from our synod. Uh, they sent me prayers for each month and then each Sunday in the month of different events that are going on in the synod. Today the prayer is going to be for the Way Lutheran Church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. That will be included in the special prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. Obeying your Father's will, you endured the cross and scorned its shame. And now you sit at the right hand of the throne of God, governing all things. Lord, we confess that it was for us and for our salvation that you came into this world to suffer and die. For your unselfish sacrifice on our behalf, help us to show our gratitude to you in everything that we say, think, and do. As we walk through this life, keep us from being entangled by sin. When that way involves pain, suffering, or persecution, help us view things as evidence of your loving discipline 
intended to draw us ever closer to you. Lord Jesus, we also thank you for blessing our synods 100 missions in 10 years effort with a strong start toward the goal of 100 new missions and 75 mission enhancements by 2033. We also pray for our home mission in Fredericksburg, Virginia, the Way Lutheran Church. Thank you for providing them with their own building. Help them and all of our congregations to stay focused on gathering around your gospel in word and sacrament and sharing it with our communities. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.